This is Pretty Brook Presents, and today, Pretty Brook Presents an interview with Representative Abigail Spanberger. She is the representative of the 7th District in Virginia, and um, just a little bit of background about this. I reached out to Representative Spanberger um, before uh, she got into office when she was just a candidate. Um, and the reason I did that is I had actually reached out to um, the incumbent, the person who had been the incumbent at the time, um, because I had issues with Medicaid and trying to get um, services for uh, Brooke. And I'd reached out to him and I did not hear a response back. And given that it was the election time, I also reached out to candidate Spanbarker um, and um, she responded, her team responded. And I had an opportunity not only to speak to her about the um, imminent issues, such as um, making sure that I had the Medicaid for um, my daughter, but also talk to her about some of the other disability rights issues. And she was very amenable to, to hearing those things. And since then, I've had an opportunity to see her in different uh, at different events and um, kind of put a bug in her ear again about some of the other um, issues. Um, and so I, um, I, I reached out to her team to ask if she'd be interested in talking to everyone about the issues involving um, uh, disability rights, and um, her team said yes. So um, uh, this is, I will say, this is nonpartisan. <laughs> I'm not um, promoting uh, the representative or uh, a particular party, um, and I'm hoping to get um, uh, politicians on the other side as well. But I did want, I think it's important, whatever, whatever your politics, to um, hear from our representatives about the issues um, that are facing the disability community because they are the ones that have the ability to make the change. They are the ones that, ha that have the ability um, to uh, address some of our concerns. And if they, if they don't do it, then <laughs> you know, we have the power to vote them out. So um, I, I, I hope that you take away something from this, uh, this interview um, of Representative Spanberger. Hi. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just trying to get myself set up. I was set up downstairs and then that's okay. Take your time. <laughs> the kids got loud downstairs, so I had to. Know. I completely understand. <laughs> uh, how's Brooke? She's doing really good. We're we're trying to s survive this uh, the quarantine, and she just had a a meeting for school about an hour ago. Okay. <laughs> and um, I don't know if you remember, but I have another little one now. <gasps> oh, you know. Oh my gosh, that's right! Yeah, I, last time I saw you, I was pregnant. There was, the baby wasn't there. Oh my yeah, gosh! So she, she's nine months old now. What's her name? Blair. Blair. Oh, that's beautiful, Brooke and Blair. Oh, thank you. So we have Brooke, Ava, and Blair Avery. Oh, and is she doing well? Is she oh, sleeping she's well? She's doing so good, and she's like, she's, um, crawling and trying to walk and we're getting to experience all of this stuff that you know we didn't really get to experience with Brooke I mean of course we love our Brookie too but yeah it, but it's different almost like starting over in some ways wow. yeah so we were really excited so how does how's Brooke adjusting to be a big sister um she's adjusting at first it was challenging <laughs> because she had been it had just been her for four yeah. years so it was um we actually in terms of um like the red stuff we were thinking oh there was something going on she was because she you know she can't fully communicate so we yeah. were, there was some there's something that's going on with her and then um she was like crying and whimpering and I, she was having these like anxiety attacks and all this kind of stuff and and then 
finally we took her to the doctors and stuff and finally a doctor said i think it's like you know adjusting to being <laughs> and so i started having um brooke mommy sleepovers oh. really <laughs> yes I mean, she felt like she was getting that little bit of attention she was missing yes and and now uh, it's um with um we we usually do them on thursday nights and so now some Thursday nights, I'll say, okay, it's Thursday night. Do you want to do Brooke mommy sleepover? It's Brooke's choice. And sometimes she'll say no. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. So she, she knows she just, she's established and she's established <laughs> her sort of dominance and everything. Exactly. Exactly. It's so cute. So, but it's and they're they're blending together and the little one is already, she's um like bringing stuff. If I say, this is for Brooke, she'll, she'll have it in her hand and crawl over and give it to her, give it to Brooke. Cause she's oh. doing a lot of stuff really quickly. Like she's take, you know, taking a few steps and all that kind of stuff. It's nine months. It's wow. yes. It's crazy. So we are exact. We are super excited. <laughs> oh my gosh. And how are yes. you hanging in there with the quarantine? Well, that one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you was because I feel like the um, the whole thing about this quarantine it for people with uh, folks with disabilities, yeah, it's really really rough. And I'm not saying that there's necessarily an action item for, yeah. for you as a representative, but it's just it's one of those things that it's like for some people I know they are saying no one is coming in because of, you know, the health risks and all that kind of stuff. But then that puts a lot of challenges on the, you know, the caregivers. And then if you do have people come in, like we are still having a couple of people come in, you're thinking about extra precautions. Like we take temperatures every time. We make sure that they're, you know, washing their hands and doing all of the things that they need to do. But we know that it's, you know, a risk. It's an informed risk. It's a, you know, we're trying to be as cautious as we can, but it's still a risk. So, I mean, I know everybody is in some way or another trying to deal with quarantine, but I feel like folks who have disabilities, it's just that added layer. Now, and have you, I'm curious, to do. <laughs> have you received any, or, or where are you going for your guidance in terms of what are some of the reasonable steps and precautions that you can take if you are going to continue to have someone come into your home to, to help with caregiving? So I go to the CDC. I, I've looked, I keep going to get updated, to find out um, additional information. If there are um, new guidelines about washing hands, obviously from the beginning it's been washing hands and six feet, you know, hard. Of course you can't do that with caregiving, but you know, even kind of keeping the caregivers informed about things in their spare time. And it's uh, obviously there's a line because you can't tell people what to do in their free time, but you can kind of get an idea of the type of things that people are doing to see if that's a type, the type of person you want in your home. Mm -hmm. In their personal lives are following those rules, social distancing when they can, wearing masks when they're out in public. Um, I know the governor has just had, has a new order now about, um, I guess it's in public buildings. Wearing masks in public buildings, yes. Wearing masks, yeah. So people who are following those kinds of guidelines are, are the people that I would prefer to have in my home if they're helping with caregiving services. Wow. And, you know, I know that just in terms of some of the, the questions that I have, have had if, and, and been interested in hearing, um, you know, I, as we're seeing a, a drop in state revenues um, and potential for reduced community services, potentially over the next few years, if states are forced to make any cutbacks. And you know, just so you know, I fully support uh, the federal government providing assistance to state and localities because this is the sort right. of, you know, we, we think about the teacher salaries, we think about police department funding, we think about, you know, first responders and fire, but so much of what our states and localities do is, is often unseen unless you have a particular need in your 
um, in your family. And, and Congress did give states a boost with their FMAP um, funding to help pay for some services. But I'm, I'm curious, sort of looking past the immediacy of now, um, what, do, what are some of the things that are on your mind, not just as a parent, a caregiver, but also with your background as an attorney uh, and, and your perspective on all of this? I think one of the biggest things for services for um, folks who ha have in their family someone with a disability is the caregiving piece. Yeah. Compensation, fair compensation. And I know that we, I know that we're in quarantine. I know that there's a, you know, everyone is kind of trying to figure out the resources piece of it. Um, but at least long-term thinking because one of the, the concerns that I hear over and over again, and we've been faced with, is that, that it's, it, the, the payout, the hourly wage for someone who is doing these caregiving services is $9.40 an hour. It's not even at the $10 mark. And we're talking about, I mean, even in my daughter's case, and she's only four, it's heavy lifting. It's, she's, she wears a diaper. She, um, there are things, you know, even the, the piece about communication, it takes skill and time to learn that what she means by certain things, you know, she's communicating, but it's nonverbal. She has the Toby eye gaze system that she's now starting to use to communicate, mm -hmm. helping her to try to figure that out. I mean, there, there's a lot of skill that's required yeah. for like that and first you know it maybe we can get you know somebody who just graduated from high school who wants a you know a part-time job or something but I think if if those wages are increased there will the frequency the ability for folks to be able to to be able to stay longer mm -hmm. um, and the, the ability for people to you know keep those people in place um, after they've kind of picked up, know what's going on. Okay, this is what you do and this is how we do. Those, those kind of things would be very important because it's, it's constantly a shuffle for, for folks with, uh, with parents with um, uh, kids with disabilities and all, all people, not just, you know, I'm speaking as a parent, but um, it's, it can be very challenging to keep people in place because you, know, you talk about $9.40 an hour, you could go work at a restaurant, a local restaurant, you know, or you could, you know, a fast food place. Um, and these are people that, you know, to a certain degree, you have to have a certain amount of skill and it's hard labor. It's, it's a lot of work to do it. So yeah. I'm always you have, about you have like to, <laughs> that. And you have to have a heart for it because yes, it, especially for a child with disabilities or for an adult at any age, there's a, there's a certain patience and focus that's oh, very yes. different from other types of jobs. Exactly. And, and so I, I'm curious, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you, you mentioned the salary and, and the $9 and 40 cents, but beyond that, how can we as a society, as a community ch change how caregiver professions are valued or supported, um, you know, or certainly as, as compensated because I, you know, what I think is the interesting portion of this discussion is I've spoken at length with nursing home owners, the Nursing mm -hmm. Home Association of Virginia, because so much of what we've seen in our long-term care facilities and in our nursing homes in Virginia as it relates to COVID-19 outbreaks, you know, they've been responding, um, you know, aggressively the best they can. There's been some challenges, but um, among some of the contributing factors in Virginia and elsewhere is that there are caregivers who work in multiple facilities. And that, that comes down to, you know, at its core salary, um, but there's other elements there. So I'm, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that as a broader element. Yeah, I think as just generally, um, and I don't know how to describe it other than professionalize it a little more. Um, if you're, because that was one of the first things I thought about with the nursing homes. My, my dad growing up, he was a corrections officer and he also worked part-time in a nursing home as an aide. Oh, wow. That was one of the first things that I thought about. Like a lot of the folks who worked in the nursing home where he worked, also had other jobs. It, yeah. 
not, it was, I mean, it, it, it comes to, the, it obviously is about the salary, but it's also, like you said, the greater idea of if something were to happen, like it's happening now with this pandemic, these folks touch so many different areas. And I would not be surprised if some of these other nursing home um, caretakers have been in a similar situations. They are not only in a high risk area with the nursing home, but they're also going somewhere else like a corrections facility mm-hmm. bring, and potentially bring that stuff back and forth. And that's not just about this pandemic. Yep. If you work as my father did as a corrections officer, even in just normal times, and then you're coming and working in a nursing home facility, there it's two different dynamics and you're cross contaminating really in a sense. You know? And what do you, how do you combat that? I mean, I don't really know what the answer is, but that's something to consider um, in, in terms well, and, of- And I think as we look at a, an aging population across the country, then there's really a very clear, I think there's a clear opportunity for us to look at this job set and this skill set and and even you know those who caregivers who aren't necessarily only working with seniors but i think mm-hmm. looking in the context that if we do have a population that's aging and living longer mm-hmm. um, how do we adapt to that and and you know there's i i've had the opportunity to meet many caregivers uh through seiu and other organizations um, mm-hmm. that uh, represent uh, in-home caregivers in particular, you know, and there's, there's just a tremendous amount of love and commitment to the people that they serve. Oh, yes. um, but giving uh, kind of a broader recognition, you know, if I, if someone says I'm a teacher, I'm an attorney, I'm a nurse, you, you have a concept of what that is. I'm a corrections officer, all of these things. Whereas, you know, a, a caregiver just even culturally is a little bit more nuanced. If I work mm-hmm. at a nursing home, that's still not kind of conveying if you're in that caregiver role, what you're actually doing. And so I think Uh there's a place for us to have a better cultural understanding. And frankly, you know, a a lot of that does relate back to salary and wages. Um, And, you know, it's a broader discussion related to the minimum wage writ large, but particularly in a place where you have individuals who have skill sets, be it with the technology that Brooke's using or even Mm -hmm. how to lift and move someone safely. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at the bottom line, they're really caring for our most vulnerable um, mm-hmm. citizens. Well, and the other piece of it is that even in trying to get caregivers to come to our home, those who would be specifically interested in working with people like Brooke, mm-hmm. it's very difficult to even maneuver. I mean, we go to some of the, you know, the, the sites that you've heard about, um, you know, ba- just generally in, about babysitters, but there doesn't seem to be this, you know, I guess it goes back to that professional part of it. You know, mm-hmm. there, there is this particular skill set that some people have or desire to have, mm-hmm. and they don't necessarily, there's no like one or two outlets. It, you know, you just go to a babysitting site and say, hey, I'm, I'm explaining that, you know, this isn't a typical child. This is a child with special needs. And this, are you interested in doing this? And so I have gone to like, you know, people who are in school to be physical therapists or occupational therapists or people who want to be nurses, all those, you know, I try to focus on those kind of people because those are the people who would really they really get into like the the Mm -hmm. pieces for Brooke and all that kind of stuff. But again, there's no, I don't think that there's like a, a a database or at least to my knowledge of somewhere Mm -hmm. where you find people who really want to use those particular skills. And I feel like, you know, beyond the, the, the salary compensation piece, it's, it's kind of like, well, I mean, if you wanted to be a teacher, you kind of have a general idea of where you go, you know, but here it just is like, it's all lumped together. Like, you know, the 15 year old babysitter who's watching kids for an hour, you go to the same place to find somebody who wants to use these kinds of skills. And I, and I keep coming back to that because like, I love our, that our sitters and stuff. they really do a lot of 
hard work. And I would venture to guess that a lot of people feel that way about the people that they've kept for a long time. It's like they become part of the family. They know you know, they know Brooke just as well as I do. If she's cranky that day, if she, you know, she, with Rhett, they have um, issues with constipation. Before I even see it sometimes, they're like, oh, I can see it in her face. She's, something's going on. Something's going on, Leslie. And they have, they, they get to know the child really well. And so I, I can't speak highly enough of like the caregivers who, because they do the hard work of helping you take care of your children. It help, It gives us a break. The respite care, I can't speak highly enough of the, the Medicare respite. It gives us time to kind of like, you know, like sometimes we'll take Blair and just be able to go out for an hour and, you know, before all of this, <laughs> you know, go out for an hour and come back more rejuvenated. I mean, it's just, and how often do you have how often do you have help coming in to help with Brooke? Well, we've been doing since this is the quarantine has been happening. It's been it depends. So okay. I try to have somebody come in during the work day to help because we're still both working full time at home. <laughs> yes, with two little ones. So we try to have people come in at least part of the day. Um, we don't do as much of the respite on the weekends now because we're trying to limit the number of people and the amount of time. But um, pre-pandemic, we used to have someone come in at least for a couple of hours on the weekend, just so if it's like grocery shopping or something like that, we would have time to go do that and have Brooke with the caregiver. But it's, um, it, it's very helpful to be able to do that. Um, and I, I want to be true to my word because I know you <laughs> have lots of stuff to do and, and, and it's, I've gone completely over. <laughs> oh, well, and I'm, let's see. Well, it, well, let me, let me just to, to just finish it up. Cause yeah. I, I think, you know, with all of what we have going on in the world and as we see mm -hmm. people in the streets protesting in support of mm -hmm. the rights of others, the rights of others to live, um, mm -hmm. at the most basic level. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm curious if just to continue the conversation for a minute about, uh, discrimination related to individuals with disabilities and those may, who may have, uh, you know, who may be able to go into the workforce or those with more significant disabilities who, for them, that's not a possibility. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, Again, given your background as an attorney, uh -huh. and your extensive background, kind of working in this space, yes, um, as it relates to the the civil rights of those with disabilities. Oh yes, um, you know, from a federal level, because you know that that's my role. Right. Is there more that you think we can do? And then I guess the other question would be for the citizens, for everyday people um, who may have a loved one in their life with a disability or who may not, how, how can people in the day-to-day -day rush of, mm -hmm. of normalcy um, and their, their lives advocate for the, the rights of those with disabilities? Yeah. So one of the things for me um, that has come up several times is the idea of um, healthcare rationing. Okay. Um, and so I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but that it's been those with disability. So during this pandemic, what has happened is folks have said, um, we don't have enough ventilators. It, I mean, because of the social distancing, maybe this isn't as big of a problem now. We don't have as many ven ventilators. We may not have as many hospital beds, hospital rooms. And so they were looking at issues of who can who, who, let's decide who gets to have these ventilators. And so one of the fears in the disability community is that um, when they're rationing out these uh, ventilators and hospital rooms, folks like my daughter, who may not have potentially the same lifespan as some other person's daughter, may not get the room based upon that. And I've actually seen um, documents that talk about, you know, from different hospitals about their policies in terms of determining 
health care rationing. Now, I don't know if that... I don't know if that's in from like a survivability perspective, right? Like right. So they're viewing it, but at the end of the day, it's it's yeah, it's like de- it could be detrimental, and I I think it's you know a larger disability rights issue. Um, another issue that I've um, been thinking about in terms of disability, you know, and on a glo- a, a national level, is the whole idea of um, during this pandemic is voting rights. Yeah. Um, you know, for for those who have disabilities, but you know, are able to do so, who are able to vote, I am kind of concerned about how it will play out if they're, you know, in terms of not allowing mail-in ballots or uh, what, how people may decide whether or not they come to the voting booths in November. Um, because if there is another, you know, big outbreak and you're, you have a compromised immune system, you may not want to come to, to vote, but, it, but you may not have, you know, mailed in a ballot. And that, of course, you know, some of the particulars of that will depend on each state. But and, that's a big issue for me, too. And typically what, what you've seen, and I know Brooke is not old enough to be eligible to vote no. yet, but um, within the larger community, are there any trends in, in terms of historically, and you know, Virginia is now shifting to where we don't need to have a reason, yes. um, but I believe that those with disabilities who felt that they were unable to make it to the polls, I don't remember which number it is, but that's an eligible reason. Um, in in Virginia and I in Virginia. you know and I I don't know for sure about other states I don't know all of the rules um, in terms of it, it being an eligible uh, reason in uh, in other states but you're, yes that's my understanding in Virginia that would have been an eligible reason even before the the rules do, do you have a sense in terms of kind of preference or recommendations or I imagine it probably depends person to person and kind of scope of disability to scope of disability but um, has the ability to vote absentee been um, one of great importance within the disability community? Well, that's been, you know, I'm putting on my lawyer hat now. <laughs> that's my, my understanding as the lawyer piece of it. Um, I, I have, um, you know, there have been a lot of people who have had challenges um, with being able to go, uh, actually go to the polling place. Um, and part of the um, issue could be that, you know, there could be something that comes up because, you know, there, I mean, when you talk about disability, it's such a big, broad category. So there are some people who would, you know, may have a disability that is a flare up, you know, there are things that happen. And it ebbs and flows in terms of the time. Yeah. Of time. So that was that, you know, in, in my former legal life that that was something that became i saw you know that that happened and one of the things that i had done it was advocate for absentee across the board mm-hmm. i think um there are challenges that arise um either you know there could be a long-standing one or one that's periodic mm-hmm. um, and that's something that i i am appreciative that the it's ex- being expanded in terms of absentee voting because it's, I feel like that that's a big, a big and I and I do think it's important because even those who have a valid excuse to vote absentee, there's still that sense of, well, what if I could make it to the polls? Does that mm-hmm. rise to the level where I should be checking this box? And it puts exactly. a lot of stress on people related to whether or not they meet a threshold that perhaps is, you know, one that they're they're creating because it's not so well defined. So I do think that's really important. And mm-hmm. I mean, and I, I would just note that really anyone, um, a reminder of what a congressional office can do. Uh, you know, my office works on constituent services, works in community outreach. Mm-hmm. So, you know, for anyone who, um, you know, pays attention to your work and um, is engaged with you, I would just want to remind everybody that um, if there's, any help that's needed with a federal agency, most kind of especially a social security, our office can mm-hmm. be of assistance. Um, and even if everything's going well um, with any claims, it's always helpful to be in touch with us so that we can be involved if, if you need us. Um, and then 
particularly in, in light of the COVID-19 crisis and ongoing pandemic. For those who are eligible for stimulus checks or have any questions about those, um, you know, our office is a resource. And then once we get back to a place where we're engaging post-pandemic, uh, you know, whenever there's events or places to, uh, you know, be there to listen or be there to engage, uh, if, if I'm in D.C. and can't do it, I'd love to make sure that one of my, my team members is there. Um, and then if I'm back in Virginia, I'd love to make sure that, um, you know, I'm present. And uh, so I'm, I'm just, I'm grateful for the conversation, for the chance to see you, Leslie. I look I'm forward to the chance when I can give Brooke a squeeze and now yes. Blair. And meet Blair. <laughs> I know. Oh, that's amazing. Well, yes. I'll have to get a, I'll have to get a picture of big sister and little sister together. Yes, um, I will do that. There. And you know, I've got three girls, so I mean, I'm yes. going to be a bad influence on you when uh, uh, it's the last one. <laughs> no, no more. I, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Fair. Fair. Although my oldest is Claire, so I love. Yeah. Oh, that's so cute. Oh my goodness. How old is the oldest? My oldest is 11. And then oh, I have a wow. nine year old and a six year old. Oh my goodness. So, oh, wow. So I, so you're in the thick of this too with the quarantine and school homeschooling and all of those things. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And so I, and I'm, we've been, I've been mostly working from Virginia, but I've gone back to DC a fair amount, but um, you know, we're dealing with what so many other families are dealing with, which is the, the, the worry of the pandemic, the sort of chaos of trying to balance everything. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, kids that don't understand that a, a zoom meeting is work. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> My daughters have come in and like, just stepped right into the frame. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> I know because pre pandemic, it was always grandma time or some, you know, I always, it was always, Oh, if I see someone on video, it's grandma That's right. grandpa, or something <laughs> like that. And it's like, no, this is work. <laughs> Yes, they, they understand. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, keep up all of your work. If you need anything from me, please. And thank you. and thanks for the conversation today. I um, cannot thank you enough. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Good to see you, Leslie. All right. Good to see you, too. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. So there you have it. There was my interview, uh, Pretty Brick Presents interview of... Uh, Congresswoman Spanberger of the 7th District in uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And um, she talked a lot about a lot of the issues that affect the disability rights community in general. And um, if you are interested in her, learning more about her, certainly you can go to her uh, social media pages. Um, and as she said, you can also reach out once the pandemic is over. There are opportunities to go to events and those kinds of things. Um, I do that not only to talk specifically about Representative Spanberger, but I encourage people to do the same with their representatives. Um, they are public servants and um, whether they agree with your politics or not, I don't think that that has, should have any bearing on it. Quite frankly, I've I've reached out to politicians um, who have completely different uh, views than I do on the issues, but I personally feel like this is, particularly because of disability rights issues, I feel like it's an issue that uh, you know both of the major parties um, should be addressing. And, and so whether you agree with their politics or not, generally speaking, I think as advocates for the people in our lives who have disabilities, I think it's incumbent on us to reach out to our representatives, our state and local federal representatives, to talk to them about these issues. Um, and if they don't agree with, um, with, with us, then we need to try to respectfully get them to see our side of things. So um, there you have it. If you like this interview, um, please like it or comment or share. Um, and um, also please um, uh, let, let us know if there are other interviews or other things that you would like to see. Um, I'm very much interested in providing information um, and um, talking through issues that affect the disability community. 
Uh, until next time, this is Pretty Brooke Presents. I'm Brooke's mom, Leslie. Take care.